Hey, what's your problem? You have business problems? We have business solutions. Maybe. Well, maybe. Not guaranteed. Life is a fight. It is. In business, every day is a fight. Of course. So, hey, what's your problem? Yes, thank you, John David Wells. The big man with the Wells Report on the Facebook. Check him out. This is the What's Your Problem podcast, where we talk to Middle Tennessee business owners and professionals about uh, the one thing that's keeping them up. It's always something, that factor. This is an audio and video podcast. If you want to see my ugly mug do this thing, you can watch me. Or you can listen to it. Everything, all your poisons that you can pick are at whatsyourproblempodcast.com. I am your host, Jim McCarthy, with jimmccarthyvoiceovers.com. And today, dare I say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be bold and say it. A very good friend of mine. We've known each other probably going over a decade now. At least. Isn't that yep. crazy? Yeah. And uh, we go back through the radio business. He used to come in and record commercials with me, and we'd get really experimental with him. It was kind of cool. Indeed. I always say Jim taught me how to talk on the radio. Really? Yeah. Hey, I'll take it. <laughs> Dr. Kelly Rice, thank you, and uh, welcome to the show. It's been way too long for us to sit down and have a chat. Indeed, but here we are. Here we are. Yeah. So for the longest time, you've been here in the Middle Tennessee area doing... Uh, Dental artistry, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. Is that how we describe it? Well, it's a great way to describe it because, you know, we always say dent- dentistry is an art and a science. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but as always, we're going to kick things off with what we call the random five, which are truly random questions. Five of them, which is why we call them the random five. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, random five is brought to you by Kalioka Company. They are one of the... Uh, best cleaners you can get out there the technology is probiotic based all natural takes the smell of cat urine out of things which is a nearly impossible scent to get rid of check those guys out the links in the description okay question number one here we go what inconsequential superpower would you like to have Hmm. (laughs) sometimes they're just funny Uh, uh, go to clone myself wow that was quick yeah you're on top of it i mean why that's, is that? Well, I think that's because there's not enough time to do all the things I get it. that I want to do. I mean, I'm sure everybody could say that, but... I think we're probably getting on the crux of a potential problem we could talk about later, right? Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right, so uh, let's see. What's the best lesson? Question number two. What's the best lesson you've learned from a work of fiction? From a work of fiction? I would say never go down into the basement by yourself. Oh my goodness! You are on top of these things. I Look mean, at you. that just makes sense. It right? does totally make sense. But they do it in every single horror movie. Of course. Yeah. yeah. You well, know, the voice comes out, "Get out," <laughs> and they don't get out. They stick around. Not smart. Why do they do that? Okay, so uh, question number three: Who in your life has the best slash worst luck? Best, worst luck. Yeah. In my life. Yeah. Hmm. You know. This is not a. This is not a political <laughs> podcast, right? No. Well, we, we we meander into all different you know sets and, of weeds. And you said in my life, but yeah. you know, it, the first thing that came up is I tell you what that Donald Trump he has good luck and he has terrible luck. But he doesn't like everybody else, right? Yeah. Yeah. So there other, we go. Other than that, I don't know. I mean, he was in our life <laughs> for four years. You yes, know? whether we liked it or not. Right? <laughs> Maybe he will but, be again. Who well, knows? Yes. Uh, what fashion? They were question number four, I believe, right? I don't. I can't keep track with numbers. I was in radio. <laughs> you you know this all too well. What fashion trend makes you cringe or laugh every time you see it? Bell bottoms. Yeah. Were you a bell bottoms person back in the seventies? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I wonder what was I thinking? Although I shouldn't say that because they are back. Yeah. And so are mom do, jeans. Yeah. Well, they do look cute. Both of which look cute on other people. Right. But not necessarily on me. See, I would so go maybe with the, that's why uh, I cringe. Is is the mullet? Mullet is making a comeback. I at yeah. one time had a mullet. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, I wouldn't be able to pull it off again. But I mean, <laughs> I'd look like Gallagher. You know, smashing watermelons with my bald head. Question number five: What? is your best story of you or someone else trying to be sneaky and failing miserably. Wow. Told you they're random. Yeah. Well, 
it would have to be oh she'll kill me for saying this but she's, <laughs> she knows it she would tell the story my youngest daughter who was told not to have a party mm-hmm. that weekend that we went out of town and she did and was obvious when we drove into our parking lot and there was a stray car there that nobody could drive home oh so you knew she's a sneaky one yeah, yeah. She was waiting for us in the den to tell us the whole story. But at least she was honest. She was ready yeah, for her, right. uh, the consequences, right? <laughs> she was. Man, I mean, that's uh, that's <laughs> something that, you know, I, I, I don't know if we're ever going to have to encounter that, God forbid. I mean, or, you know, maybe I'm jinxing us now, but uh, I've got a 16-year-old, a 14-year-old, and a 10-year-old. Uh, your youngest, how old, old are your kids? My kids are 34, 30, and 23. You see, I'm not blowing so, smoke up your, you know, where by yeah. telling you you do not look old enough to have kids that old. Well, you know, it happens in the blink of an eye, and, <laughs> and thank goodness for some pretty good night cream, you know, whatever, <laughs> and, and a very low stress job. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, especially that, Jim. <laughs> so I taught you how to talk on the radio. How exactly did I do that? You, you taught this girl who was raised in the South. <laughs> mm-hmm. How to enunciate? Right. And how to punch that last letter of my la- of that last consonant of my last name? Was it a consonant? Rice, rice. Yeah. Yeah. Because how did you say it? Do you remember? Was it rice? It was probably rice, and that it just fell off at the end. Right. That yeah. But you know, you have to realize I'm married into that name, so right. I had to learn it. Mm-hmm. But that's what I remember most about what you. But it's a per, it's a me. good fitting name for you. I mean, it just it's, it's always fit you. you yeah, know? It, it has. I'm used to gentle it. gentle soul. I mean, anybody anything you'd want in somebody working on your teeth and your mouth, you'd want them to be you know generally low stress. And, right, Doctor Rice instead yeah. of Doctor Payne. That's right, you know, Doctor so. Reich. You know, <laughs> something like we don't want anybody like that. So, um, how did you get into all? Is this something you always envisioned yourself doing? Oh, um, good question. Thank you. I wanted to be a dentist from the time I was in middle school. I sort of got that idea in my head. I think my parents kind of gave me sort of the idea, but I went to the orthodontist like all kids at that age. And so I got the idea, and I just stuck with it. And it's pretty amazing that what's the statistics? You're going to change not just jobs three or four times in your lifetime, but you're going to change careers that many times. And I've had this career for over well, I've been in practice thirty six years and mm-hmm. still enjoying it and trying to and reinventing it and making it more um, relevant to what the world's going through and what's needed. I think, but that it, it goes back to to junior high. To me, it, uh, as as I've known you throughout the years, uh, if I had to really, um, you know, I'm a big fan of if you can't be first in a category in marketing create a category in which to be first. So, you know, Coke and Pepsi, they always battled it out for first and second place. Coke always winning pretty much. Mm -hmm. You can all, and then that's where you got the diet brands and stuff like Mm -hmm. that. And uh, the lemon lime brands, Lyman as they called them back in the eighties. Those are the things that I think about. And I've always said that you're um, like a luxury dental artist. I don't know if I've ever said that to you. I, I don't recall those words. No. Um, maybe because when somebody says that, I just don't automatically think of myself as that, even though I'm constantly striving to be mm-hmm. that. Um, but I think that we're, it's not that as dentists or as cosmet- cosmetic dentists, we're in competition with each other, trying to beat each other out like Coke and Pepsi. I, I would like to think not. Right. However, um, you know, we're in competition with all the other things in life that are luxury. Yeah. That are sort of um, not just luxury, but we we expect to have in our homes and that we drive. And I understand that because we all want that. But I don't know if that makes sense. But no, that's it does. how I see what I do and where where it is in the um, in the landscape of of what we buy. You've always just done a good job at in a commoditized industry. You know, where you mm-hmm. can kind of throw a rock and hit a dentist and hit a doctor or whoever to decommoditize yourself. And you did it in a way of personal branding. 
right? And it's always, as long as I've known you, it's always been about your personality, your personal brand that drove the business, right? Right. And and I I think that is out there in front. Now, and especially over the past five years in my practice, it's about, um, I I guess I have to be out there as the front man or woman, so to speak. But my team creates that culture, mm-hmm. and that's what you see time and again. What other people say, other patients say about us. Mm-hmm. At least those those that, <clears throat> who get what we're about, which is about prolonging lifespan, teeth. You know, the life of your teeth and and your life when it comes to treating sleep apnea. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I really give my team a lot of credit. But you, the, you're the one who who curates the team, and well, you've you've had to come up with the culture tenets you know, the pillars of the, of what the culture is. And mm-hmm. it's, I believe that any, you know, business owner, a CEO is really just driving the culture, you know, that's how you're going to build your business. You know, I know you've interviewed um, Jana Truman here on your show yeah. and she said something that really made me think a lot about why it is that I do what I do. And I learned a lot of how to create whatever I have in my practice when I was younger, seeing how my parents, my dad was in business and he, they would always invite the visitors into their home. Mm-hmm. I've always felt like if you come into my practice, I want us to treat you like if you were walking into our dining room or our living room. Mm-hmm. And that that I've been doing that for a while, but it's only recently that I've really realized that's why, that's what impacted me so long ago and why I do that and why I want people to feel that way. Now, how do we package it up and verbalize it? Yeah, right. exactly. <laughs> yeah, and keep doing it so that you can keep on doing it. Right, right. And if right. you have a new team member, that they really get it as mm-hmm. well. Now, I mean, you have a uh, – what's your longest – you, you t- tend to keep your team a long time, mm-hmm. turnover-wise? I mean, do they stick around a long time? They, I do. I have – it's hard to remember the numbers right now, but I have one who's been um, in practice with me for 26 years, another 22, another 18. Um, oh, Wow. Uh, we've hi- that, we- that alone says something. Well, it, it's it's we we were fortunate to find each other. I mean, right. I did set out on purpose to figure out who I wanted to hire. But Do you remember the kind of qualities you were looking for? Um, happy, friendly. Right. You know, there's no there's no tolerance in my practice for um, bad moods or. Or, or talking behind each other's back, right? And we we have some of those things are pretty well spelled out, you know, when it comes to core policies. Even we put it in writing, right? So. Right. See, I, I'm always championing uh, one of my clients, which is Mercedes Benz of Music City here in town. Mm-hmm. The ownership is all about culture, and their uh, their big thing is that we're not a we're not a car dealership; we're a luxury retailer. And we will trip, mm-hmm. fall, and skin our knees to delight our clients, our customers. And they have probably 27, maybe it's even 30 by now, um, mm-hmm. cultural pillars. They call it their quiver of arrows. And it's 30 some odd uh, points that they've conjured over the years that just, this is, this is who we are. And part of working there is wearing a, the culture card around your neck. So on a lanyard. Huh. So at any given time, you could look down and say, you know, it'll basically show you how to handle just about any situation. Wow. It's very interesting I see it, to see it in play, especially in a car dealership, which typically yeah. are just, you know, nasty, venomous, poisonous cultures. So, exactly. I so, mean, uh, they can be, you know. Well, that, that's something to follow right there. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, but, you know, getting into other things with, um, you know, other business ventures, have you done anything? Has it just always been dentistry over the years? Well, it's always really been about dentistry. Mm -hmm. And um, in a bit of a frustration about in in terms of hiring dental assistants, I did in 2014 start a dental assisting school Mm -hmm. that runs inside my practice. And one of my team member teaches and And it's a group effort so that we can provide a small atmosphere for dental assistants to, for young people, uh, young men and women, to learn dental assisting so that Mm -hmm. they can uh, go on that certification and registration pathway um, and not have to spend 20 grand, you know, to, to go to school and do that. So it's an alternative. 
in a way, or it, a supplement. It's, it is a separate entity mm-hmm. that runs parallel with what we're doing because they'll come in and intern in our office, in other dental offices too, because we have other dentists calling us and looking for assistance sometimes. But it also allows us to cherry pick from that group. You're, we, you're shaping them and molding exactly. them how you want them. Exactly. I see. And, you know, you, they can you know, pass all the qualifications to get into the program. We see pretty quickly if they are a potential for us to, to hire or to recommend to another dentist. Um, and it's been, it's been good. I, I've had some great uh, em, temp, uh, employees. Some of One is still with me. One is not, but only because she just went to dental school. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we're really proud of what our, our students have done, even though they're not with us, but we're proud of the fact that many of them have jobs before they even graduate. Well, I mean, you're almost extending your brand in a way. Mm-hmm. You're, you're, you're branding, well, not literally, but, you know, but, yeah. that culture, that feeling of what you believe in is being instilled in somebody else. I mean... Maybe there's an idea for a Kelly Rice methodology that other dental law, other doctors or businesses could adopt. You know what I mean? Maybe there's a virtual training class. You I've, do. I've often thought about that if I've had a, any particular experience in another business. I've thought, hmm, I wonder if they know this. But I mean, don't you listen to other business owners, especially with us? We're also uh, BNIers. I forgot to mention that. We're both in the same mm-hmm. BNI chapter. And it's funny, when you visited and you were trying it out, I was like, oh my goodness, this would be so awesome if she came on board with us. And because, indeed I did. And she did. Yes. Yeah. Because I mean, you've tried so many things over the years. You tried radio. You you still do direct mail, I believe. Mm-hmm. Direct mail is, is really big for us. Really? Yes. I, ironically, yeah. But it is. But I mean, that's, uh, you know, what, what being in front of other business owners, as B&I puts you in front of you, you do one-to-ones with other business owners mm-hmm. and professionals. Do you find yourself being able to apply your skill set and your background and your experience into their business and be like, oh my gosh, dude, I don't know why you're having a problem with this. Here's what I would do based on my experience. Yes. It- we there, there are definitely a lot of times when we'll discuss it. If we're having a power group, mm-hmm. we'll discuss issues that we're having. And, you know, I feel like there, I got something to contribute. Yeah. You know? Well, I mean, it's busy. So, yeah. You just know, right? Yeah, and it's people. Yeah. You, you can't, you can never force somebody else to, you know, even buy a particular model of Mercedes if they don't want it, if they don't, you know. Why not? It, I have. Well, <laughs> but, but you wanted it. I know. I'm going to gather that you wanted it. <laughs> well, there were, there were people that wanted certain kinds of cars. Uh, okay. We called it a uh, champagne dreams on a beer budget okay so yeah but you know there's always an option for them to buy something else yeah so you know with dentistry nobody really wants to come and see me they everyone wants health Mm -hmm. and everyone kind of defines it a little differently so we you know when your question was you know when i get together with other business owners you know do i have something to offer and Mm -hmm. we talk do we have things in common to talk about and we do because Getting to that person's why, no matter if it's for their teeth or what kind of car they want, that mm-hmm. that's just really important because then, you know what, it takes all the pressure off of off of me. Right. It takes the pressure off the person who is who is selling, for lack of a better word. We're gonna we're gonna give then. We're gonna give them what they want. Do you have a preliminary interview that you put your you go with your clients or um, or we, on certain procedures? We, um, well, I do spend a lot of time with my patients. I'll say as much time as they want to spend. You know, some right. people want to come in and get out, and that, that's good. But there are other people who are, who, because of where they're at, whether they're embarrassed or they know they've got a lot of problems, they, we really need to spend time with them. So that's nor, not necessarily a, a preclinical type interview, but sometimes it can be. Mm-hmm. But what, what we, are starting to do more of is a patient may call in with wanting a cer- certain kind of an appointment, um, for example, a, a sleep apnea appointment, and that mm-hmm. really requires a lot of education because people might know they don't want a CPAP or they know they have sleep apnea, but they don't know what we do. And yeah. so we're starting more and more to touch on those patients via even a phone call before their appointment. 
my hygienists do it for their regular hygiene. How can we make this visit go more smoothly for you? Mm -hmm. And then we know that we're not just going to rustle them in, scrape on their teeth, and then try to sell them a crown. Right. Right. So. I mean, a lot of what you're talking about, I, and you bring up the CPAPs because I'm, I've been using one for the past, I don't know, two years or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been interesting, mm-hmm. you know? Um, I, I often think of, uh, have you watched the recent Spider-Man movie? No, no. I'm afraid not. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I see your Marvel poster I know. there, and I know you love that. One of the characters <laughs> in the movie is, it has a scene where he's wearing a CPAP. It's just hilarious. Uh, okay. Well, I yeah. bet that is pretty interesting. Yeah. My story with a CPAP, everyone told me, oh my gosh, you're going to lose so much weight because your body can finally rest and everything. And I started using it and I gained like 15 pounds. I'm going, what in the crap, man? Well, you know what? The research actually shows that if before you're treated, you're tossing and turning, mm-hmm. Once you're treated, you're burning calories. Burning calories. <laughs> your and body's you, fighting for survival. <laughs> exactly. Your brain is saying, "Turn over. You got to get some oxygen to me." But yeah. then, once it's treated and you lie there and you don't move around, that it's really been shown in some of the literature that weight gain happens. Yeah, because all but, of a sudden my body can finally rest. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. Uh, but everyone oh, told sorry. me, "Oh my gosh, you know, because the, the body's getting more oxygen." And I'm like, "Oh, terrific! That you know, it's one step in the right direction. One the less thing I have to think about." No, no. And that was always my uh, my theory going into it was that, yeah, well, of course, now I can relax. So, yeah, just pack them on, man. Well, yeah. yeah is Sorry. what it is. I know. But you, you, you actually help people get off CPAPs in a way? or Well, the way that we, our, our strategy, or for lack of a better word, but our goal is that we want to reach the person who hates their CPAP. Yeah. Okay. And we don't want to talk anybody out of using a CPAP. CPAPs are 100% effective when you use them all night long. You put yourself in danger if you take the thing off at at 3 Mm a.m. But we want to reach that person who has already decided there's no way they're going to have one, so they don't even go for a sleep test. Yeah, That's dangerous. We want to reach that person who's tried one, who hated it, who has nothing. It lives in the closet collecting dust. Those are the people that we we really love helping. Yeah. Because they need it. Getting back to the other business owners that you you were able to offer value to, what do you recount? What's one story you can kind of bring up? I think what the the story I can think of is that what I've kind of already said. It's it's like we go to um, professional school or we get trained in insurance and um, have those vocations and we've got all this knowledge mm-hmm. but it really doesn't matter what matters is that we find out what that individual wants okay what their reason is and and that that's the thing that we've talked about more often than not get, getting to their why asking the right questions yeah and i didn't know that going in my you know 36 years ago well something you figure out and you learn i mean how how did you come across make that realization at first oh reading books i've i've worked with a number of consultants who have you know worked it into their programs um but you that's the thing that strikes me as amazing about you and it always has because you're always really pushing the boundaries and the envelope of how to build your business well you know in dentistry you either do crowns, fillings, you pull teeth, now we do implants, and then no. I've branched out. But that's that reinventing myself. <clears throat> 2012 is when I started working with lasers and treating sleep apnea. And, and I have learned so much about those issues and the, the need for those treatments. And it, you just have to keep, it's about keeping and always learning. You know, yeah. it's always that. It's uh, when you're green, you grow, or you're ripe, you rot. Yeah, and it, getting bored. There's nothing uh-huh. worse than having a job you're bored with, and I am not bored. Well, that's good. Yeah. What What else keeps you excited about it? Um, um. Well, just changing people's lives. Yeah. You know, where especially because so many people have underdeveloped jaws for, because of our because of the the food changes that happened you know in the 40s in 1940 
Mm-hmm. And that, and, and seeing the changes that I can create in, in an adult even, and also in children, getting to the root causes of some health problems. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's so exciting when someone says, I just came off my blood pressure medicine, and I'm, I'm only a dentist. So I would I, never, I, they have to, their physician has to do it, but their physician is seeing that they're getting better because of a mouthpiece and their blood pressure is too low, so they come off one of their blood pressure medicines. That's exciting. Off of a mouthpiece? From a mouthpiece. Really? Yeah. How did that work? Well, if, if, they, if obstructive sleep apnea mm-hmm. has been diagnosed by a physician and patient won't use a CPAP or has tried it and, and sincerely has struggled with it, then if we treat their obstructive sleep apnea with an oral appliance that pulls their lower jaw forward and pulls the tongue out of the back of the throat, mm-hmm. then that increased oxygen to their, whole, to their body is going to change everything. Every, oh, wow. every organ in the human body is affected by that. Whether so the mere not, introduction of oxygen in that manner will help with blood pressure afflictions. It, it can, yes. Wow. Now, what we know is that the reverse of that is that, that if you have sleep apnea, you will have high blood pressure, heart issues. Even now, cancer, Alzheimer's are in the mix as what are outcomes from untreated sleep apnea. Yeah. So, you speak with that uh, like every week with a passion. Behind the sleep apnea. Well, you know why I'm passionate about it. Why is that? I I think, I believe I do, but definitely uh, let's tell that story. Sure. So as I said, in 2012, I started learning about how to treat sleep apnea. Um, So it's been 10 years now. Mm -hmm. Well, in 2007, my youngest sister, who was 37, died in her sleep. Mm. I didn't know any of this. I mean, I got zero hours of this in dental school. Mm Mm-hmm. And I, I sort of knew that she had had a sleep test. And because of my position, I could get medical records and really look at what had happened. And, and so her, her sleep apnea score, we call it the AHI, mm-hmm. was 80. That's 80 times an hour she stopped breathing. Basically. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I don't think I was that high. She, she should have gone home or, or received a CPAP machine the very next day. But I remember they were moving, and you know, to a to North Alabama, and you know what happens when you get a new house? You get drapery, shrubbery, you know, and all that, and it just got pushed aside, and um, and it ended in her demise. So that is a sad story. Yeah. But that's my why. Yeah. Even yeah. even fifteen years later. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Yeah, and so you know, it's it affects. It affects us more than we we, re- we realize. I mean, every celebrity who passes away, especially at a younger age, um, we wonder about, we in my office, we wonder about, we do know that um, Carrie Fisher's death was in part contributed to by sleep apnea. Um, Chief Justice Antonin Scalia died in his hotel room with the CPAP machine unplugged. Okay. Really? And um, Reggie White, the... So I don't know. I'm not a football person, but he was a football running back, um, and he passed away as a result. Um, it was deemed because of sleep apnea, and his wife, you know, took up the the sword as well. This was years ago. I'm not sure what year that was, but but it's um, it, it's a gro- it's a growing. There's a growing awareness of it, but there is still. Not enough oomph behind it. Not enough. Yeah, it's very undiagnosed because people just don't want to face it. But, you know, when you can live to see your grandchildren and it would make a difference, then that's a reason to have it treated. Or live to, you know, play in a band in a bar on the beach. There you go. Every weekend. There you go. Like I want to do. Okay. When I get there. You had mentioned back in the 40s that there was a food shift that made our jaws, that shifted something in our jaw over, mm-hmm. what was that food shift? Well, it's just that industrial revolution. So that more processed foods right. um, became, uh, you know, eat more easy, easy to obtain. Yeah. In the, around about the 1950s or 60s, a, 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 um anthropologist, Dr. Robert Corcini, mm-hmm. 
Nice and, Irish fellow. He did, yeah. yeah. <laughs> he did a lot of research, and he culminated it around then or so. But he followed indigenous populations and compared to them to those populations like our Western civilization who had processed food introduced about the time of World War. What was that, one or two? two In the 40s two, was yeah. two, yeah. So he found that those in those cultures, that uh, populations that went straight from breastfeeding to hard beef jerky, okay, mm-hmm. had stronger muscles that helped develop their bones, their jaw bones better. From going from what went, the breastfeeding is what did that? Breastfeeding, but going to hard foods, gnawing on hard foods, because, you know, Indians and other indigenous es- the Eskimos, they their meat was beef jerky, was tough, mm-hmm. right? So it built up the muscle. Built up the muscle, and muscle wins every time when it's pith- pitted against bone, mm-hmm. right? Muscle helps that bone to grow. So compared to our Western civilization where you walk down the baby food aisle. It's all soft. All soft, you know, pulverized huh. food. And, and, you know, I'm not, I'm not criticizing people for doing that because that's all I knew when my kids were growing up. But um, it, it doesn't allow for the complete functionality of the muscles, which is the, the cheeks and especially the tongue, to help grow that upper jaw especially. Because if there's underdeveloped jaw, we you can rest assured, the maxilla, which is the fancy word for the upper jaw, is the criminal, mm-hmm. and the mandible, the lower jaw, is the victim. Whatever the mandible can only swing into the up into the maxilla, the upper jaw, in a certain position, and if that upper jaw is underdeveloped, it sets the stage for the lower jaw, where the teeth are placed. Is there enough room <laughs> for the teeth? Uh, and then it sets the stage for the size of this this st- structure, which really is not a structure, but it's yeah. a space called the airway. Mm-hmm. So it, it's Robert Corcini saw that and did his research. And so, unfortunately, you know, I went to dental school starting forty years. I graduated thirty six years ago. Forty mm-hmm. years ago, I started. None of that research was in any of our curriculum. And unfortunately, it's been kind of pushed away. In the past five years, those of us who are in this airway business, we are starting to really bring it, bring it forth. So, so it's really great that I get to talk about that so others might research it who are in a mine or a similar type of, a, of a, a, an industry because, you know, it, we do this because we're in business. Yeah. But it's especially satisfying when we're in a business that can – change a population 20 years from now if we'll just pay attention to some of those things but what i mean as you're bringing awareness to it you know uh i'm thinking product ideas right you Mm -hmm. know so all of a sudden you've got the baby market which is a multi-billion dollar market right maybe there's a a chew chew toy (laughs) (laughs) like for dogs that you give babies (laughs) yeah and i would hate to know what uh, until (laughs) <laughs> some of the mainstream pediatricians are in, gosh, you know, yeah. liability. But, uh, yeah, I but guess. you know, I mean, you moms know. and dads, they, you know, they, people seek, the moms who seek me out, they've done their research. Right. So. So you champion those, be like, hey, if you're having a, you know, a newborn breastfeed, I mean, breastfeeding is natural. Mm-hmm. That's what, you know, God made us. Yeah, you exactly. Know, how to feed babies. But mm-hmm. you know you've got these these indigenous indigenous cultures that have used beef jerky, like you said. Mm-hmm. What's a similar you know other than beef jerky? I don't know how many people are going to want to give their kids beef jerky. You yeah, know. I mean, right. So what's a, a similar um, an analogous type of a? I don't know. You know, at the table, mm-hmm. let them eat the broccoli. Don't give them a hot dog. That's right. too much of a of a risk of of um, aspiration. But mm-hmm. let them know on the broccoli. Give them a just big, a raw piece of broccoli, yeah, or lightly yeah, cooked, yeah. You don't want them softened or steamed, right? No, don't give them a little bitty carrot, yeah. you know. But but just be aware that everything that you give the child that's really soft, you know. When I was when my kids were coming along, it, we were so excited to give them that mush cereal so they sleep through the night. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's just a different mindset that we really need to embrace, and so that we can help. Did sleep apnea come about? Shortly, like in the 60s and 70s, is that when it started becoming diagnosed? Um, so, the first mouthpiece 
to help with sleep apnea mm-hmm. came out of Germany <clears throat> in the 1890s. Of course it did. Um, you know, other than that, it's hard for me to remember all the dates, but th- the father of sleep apnea, you know, was he was doing his research in the 1920s. Yeah. So it's been around a long time. I and mean, my organization, the Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine, the sister organization to the Academy of Sleep Medicine, the Physicians Group, my organization's been around for, you know, close to 30 years. Yeah. So, but again, you have to seek out either you want to do it for revenue or you seek it out because of your own personal life experience. Mm-hmm. So. Well, that's that's interesting. It, it, it's amazing the wealth of knowledge that you have. You know, just the breadth of knowledge that you that I'm 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 learning stuff here. Well, you know? I, I've just been really lucky to have some mentors who have been in this just just ahead. That's how you learn. You learn from the people who have just learned it two three, two three five years ahead of you. Yeah, and I've been so lucky. But the opportunity yeah. for you there is further. You know, becoming so much more than. You know, a a luxury dental artist, uh, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of ascending to leading a cause, if you will. Mm-hmm. You know, and saying, you know, new moms. I mean, consider doing this with your child, and uh, you know, here's the here are the reasons why you're going to prevent uh, potential sleep apnea issues down the road mm-hmm. if you you know, give them something hard. I mean, I remember my first daughter; she loved just chewing on things. You know, yeah. the little plastic cups, whatever it may be, our fingers. You know, yep. There's a natural pro- proclivity that kids have. To want to chew on stuff. Uh, and, and intuition. Right. You know? Yeah. She she had that urge, that need, like so many of those um, initial type of, um, of, well, instincts. Really. Yeah. So, but at least the mouthpieces are out there. I mean, maybe there's another product you can invent. That's right. We'll, we'll, go, in, we'll go in halvesies on it, if you want. <laughs> I'll become an investor. We'll put it out there. But even just the notion of... Um, with the amount of stuff that you know, I mean, what other ways are you looking to uh, put your business out there? Well, actually, I'll kick this off. Why not? This is about time. What's your problem? Very impromptu. Okay. How we run this show. I just feel like it whenever I kick it off. I'll kick off the jingle whenever I feel like it. I like it. Redundant. So, Dr. Kelly Rice, what is your problem? My problem. <laughs> You're enjoying the music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is good. Oh, that's the question? That's the question. What are you dealing with? I'm dealing with, um, most of the time, just educating people. Mm -hmm. And I said before, if my superpower was I could clone myself, then I could spend more time educating. Right. uh, Do you you really enjoy that part of it? I do. We just, we have in the past done... um, um, educational meetings in the office. We've started that back up again, and namely for people who, who um, hate their CPAP, you know, just to give them another alternative. There are other alternatives to, to that, and we just want everybody to know. Okay, yes, we do those, but but I say educating is really taking the time to just teach people to the extent that they want to know, you know, what. What it is we're going to do, and then people are less fearful of it because we meet so many people who are embarrassed or fearful, you know. Well, how do you? I mean, it almost sounds like you need a podcast. It does doesn't it? Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. You know. Do you know anybody? I may know. So, I may, may know somebody who can put podcasts together. <laughs> They're okay. So yeah. They are but I mean, that's uh, you know, with all the things I've known you to do over the years, especially within radio, broadcast media. Um, other areas you're always promoting, you're always marketing. Why not a Dr. Kelly Rice podcast? Mm-hmm. You know, right. you know, and people people have often said, "Oh, I saw your, I heard you on the radio," mm-hmm. or "I saw, I got your mailer," and 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 sometimes it's it's said to me in a, a little negative connotation, mm-hmm. you know. But the truth is, to if them, you they took it negatively. They they see it as negatively to be marketing yourself. You know, well, to me, if you if you've got something that can help people and you don't tell the world about it mm-hmm. then shame on you what are you, you know? doing on social media anything oh, on a daily um, basis uh, we we have some presence yeah um it's not as good as it should be but we we are we're trying you know we have a instagram and and trying to get out the word yeah of what we do if you had to own a word in the mind of your prospect, of your prospective client, 
What do you think it would be? Own a word. Yeah. Word. Or even a phrase. Six words or less. Um, I don't know if this answers the question, but we've heard it back so many times. I would say to you, dentistry that can change your life. Oh, my goodness. We've heard it. Mm-hmm. And it seems... Well, bit, where have you it, heard it from? What, tell me some stories. I mean, it, it uh, seems uppity for me to repeat that back, but we actually embraced it, and it's part of our new rebranding yeah. that we created. Well, you know, it's. I, I think. I think that I am so used to doing, you know, dentistry and and the sleep apnea appliances that we do, and the the adult expansion to create a a, a bigger place for the tongue to live. I I, I just. I don't, I don't think of myself that when they tell me, oh, you changed my life with this, I, I'm surprised, which I shouldn't be, because I'm obviously, I know this is the right thing to do, and I'm passionate about it, but we had a patient who d- did a recent video testimonial for us, and he used those very words, and I thought, wow, how could I not realize that I did that, you know? Mm-hmm. But um, I think that just goes to, Sometimes we don't show others we appreciate them as much as we should, mm-hmm. and, and we're more apt to criticize than to build up. And we need to live in a world where we're building people up, and that built me up so much that I thought, okay, I know what I did, and that's what he thought. I'm going to go out and do that for more people. Right. What about his life changed? I mean, how did he... Oh, my goodness. He said he never wanted to smile. Mm-hmm. Oh my goodness! And now he lo- he went home and he he looked in the mirror and he went home and he cried. He was so happy to smile because you just fixed the way his his teeth looked. Well, in this case, I fixed the way his teeth looked. I mean, that in and of itself. I mean, that, that's an amazing story. How many times have you heard that phrase? I've you know, I never wanted to smile before, but now I want now I do. And and I I remember hearing us well having a patient who we had re- recreated her smile. And she, she came back her next visit for a follow up, and she said, "I'm so sorry, I forgot to tell you how much I love my teeth." <laughs> so I don't know. I don't mean to be overly humble about it, but I also don't want to you know, get too puffed up about it. It's it's the reality with some people, and um, obviously, I'm really passionate about fixing teeth and making confident smiles. But I also really, really enjoy making somebody healthier and breathing better and happier. We had a patient who we did a sleep apnea appliance on, and we'd known him in the general practice for quite some time, and finally we treated his apnea. And he came in for about two, three, six visits after that, and all of my team said, you know, he's really in a good mood now. He's nice now. <laughs> so, so he's able to, so he's that not was, tired. Yeah, that was um, not, that was an Plus indirect. Plus he's put on a few pounds. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I mean, you, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, changing people's lives and um, getting people out there to, that you know, sing your praises and stuff like that. What is the one thing that really gets you in the gut that someone said to you? told a story that you just you know <gasps> give me a moment i mean i can get the kleenex out there oh, kind of thing. um i the, the, that the that one was is really high up there about you know never smiling mm-hmm. you know because a smile is the, that is the universal language yeah. we don't all say hello in the same using the same words but when mm-hmm. you smile at somebody they get what you're trying to say, you know. Are you somebody who uses somebody's name uh, when you're waiting to, uh, at a restaurant or something like that? Or you, I, I always try to make it a habit of asking the server's name. Ah, uh, or if um, they're wearing a name I, tag, I'll use their name. I, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's if similar I, to smiling at them. Yes, you know? I agree. I, I, especially when you really appreciate their service. Even if I don't appreciate their service, I do it. Because you know what it's going to (laughs) do? Make a Mac better. They'll make a Mac better (laughs) because hearing their name is music to their ears. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. I've never, I've never, I just started putting into the practice a couple of years ago where if I'm at Starbucks and if I see their name, I consciously, I'm okay, I'm going to use their name. Yeah. Uh, But I don't think uh, it's funny because recently, this is kind of a funny story. 
It's very Edward Fox esque. So here we go. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. There's a guy, you know, speaking of like millennium millennials names. <clears throat> uh, his name was Jathan. Mm. Wasn't really Jason. Wasn't mm. Nathan. And I'm going, Jathan. Okay. Well, Jathan, nice to meet you. Uh, what do you do for a living, Jathan? And he mm -hmm. starts talking to me. I said, that's really, you know, you try to use their name in a couple minutes mm -hmm. time just to kind of really cement it. It's And it's awkward at times. But at some point he looked at me, he says, are you being serious? Oh, okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'm going to, let's do, let's do. The Kelsey, oh, yeah. the, Kel the Kelsey grammar falling off of a stage sound effect is deserving <laughs> of that. That was actually, that wasn't a true story. That was a, that was a joke. <laughs> That was an Ed that Fox. I heard that, that I heard from a comedian that was he delivered it a lot better than I did. Okay, well, usually gets a bigger <laughs> laugh. <laughs> <I'm> sorry, <laughs> you do, I, but I have headphones on. I'm on a podcast. <laughs> That's okay. We have fun here. <clears throat> oh. So moving forward, I mean, I, I think a lot of you know, as I've known you over the years, you've just always been innovating. You've never been commoditized. Um, how do you keep on pushing that ball down the field? Um, one day at a time. Yeah, you know, we you we just have a routine. What do you want to be like by the time but, you know? Oh, that's such a good question. Yeah. I mean, but th I, that's the thing is that my perception of you, it's the way your life and the way your career has yeah. panned out. It looks like it's been planned. You just you just kind of let things happen. Well, yeah, I, I think that there's been a lot of planning. Okay, yeah. and I just. Um, I'm not ready to. I want to. I want to keep doing what I'm doing mm -hmm. for the next X number of years, and I'm realizing I need to make a plan for after what it, whenever that time comes that I want to do that next thing. Right. And I'm, I've just started thinking about it. You know, do I want to teach? Do I want a consulting company? Um, I've certainly been helped by people who've helped me through their consulting, and then there are so many dentists who who need to. To know some of the things that I that I know, so, absolutely. And so, who knows? I mean, dentists and business yeah. owners in general. Yes, your bedside yeah. manner is so wonderful. Well, you know, thank you very much. Is um, retirement a part of your vernacular? Gosh, you know, when you retire, you die. I know. Thank you. So I, I think that I can see myself, you know, still seeing patients one or two days a week. Mm -hmm. You know, no matter what else I do. And, and, you know, I like to take time off as well. What's your thing? What's your jam? Oh, I love music. Mm -hmm. I don't play too much anymore. What did you play? Well, Jim, You played the drums. I That's started right. out at age 11 mm -hmm. playing the drums. Look at you. Yes. And I played all through high school and college and not in dental school. My mother tried to give my, my, my Ludwig trap set away eh. at one point. And I said, what? So I, I, I still have it. And after dental school, we came back and, and settled in Franklin. And my husband was um, in a show of uh, performance of the Fantastics, mm -hmm. which is one of my favorites. I, it's an old one. So many of you out there may not know it. But And there was a drum part. Mm -hmm. And they, didn't, they only had a piano player. And he said, well, my wife has a set of drums. Mm-hmm. She'll play for free. <laughs> <laughs> did you? And indeed I did. Well, that's yes. awesome. And since then, I played at Full Tight, uh, Brentwood Town Center Theater, and loved every minute of it. Do you still have the Ludwigs? I do. Do you have any other kits? I've got, this, I've got a small little travel set that <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you need somebody to play drums for you down on the beach? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a drummer. You're so the I mean, drummer, yeah. yeah but so. we could do a double drummer, Doobie Brothers kind so, of setup if but, need be. But, you know, my I guess my dream job would be I want to be a lounge singer. So. Really? So you, so drumming and singing? Well, sort of. In, you know, in do you do shower. karaoke? I, I can sing the best when I've got two hands on the steering wheel. So. Right, right. <laughs> well, you know, I like karaoke. Right. I'm sort of limited in my, in my um, you know, what I can sing or whatever. like anything else in your life, you're so humble about it. But I imagine well, if you got behind the mic or behind a set of drums, mm -hmm. you'd blow people away. Well, I could I could hold my own. That's yeah. for sure. As can I, but I'm, I'm really <laughs> yeah. I'm really rusty. <laughs> yeah, you know I've, I haven't played. I start. I have a set of drums in my closet at home, and I'll sit down every I don't know a couple of months, and I'll play. And yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, my arms are tired, my hands are tired. <laughs> 
I bought drumming gloves. Oh, I didn't is that know. like throwing the towel in? I mean, well, that's, I mean, throwing the towel in would be yeah. quitting completely. That's but, true, but I mean, it's. Uh, I didn't know they made such a thing. Drumming gloves? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, it helps me. Uh, we saw the band Anthrax. Uh, my drummer friend and myself. He plays for a uh, major, yeah. well-known country. Yeah, artist, I, made, Rich. I met him. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we went to go see Anthrax, whose drummer was a major influence of mine Mm -hmm. in my formative teenage years when I was practicing all the time. And I got to meet him on occasion a couple of times. We interviewed him on Rich's show, on his podcast. His name is Charlie Bonante. And it made me feel better because Charlie wears gloves. Okay. You know, and these guys are in it. They're a thrash metal band. They're all pushing 60 or are in their 60s. And they're Mm -hmm. still playing like they're 25. Yeah. And it was awesome. But they played at the Ryman. Wow. I know. That kind of a band at the Ryman? Just amazing. Who were the yeah. people who shaped you growing up? Were you a Ringo gal? Ringo. Yeah. Buddy Rich. Mm-hmm. Did Car- you uh, okay. sing, sing, sing? Uh, well, you know what? We did that in in a uh, marching band, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you did all the formal stuff. Yeah. But I have to say, it wouldn't surprise you, Karen Carpenter. No, that's not surprising at no, all. No, no. Yeah, she was great. Wonderful. Yeah. Still, I'm a, such a fan. Love those old songs. Man, I would love, like, if I were, like, implementing social media ideas and strategies and content for you. Yeah. I would just, I mean, do, like, dental videos, little, you know, inspirational talks, and every now and then throw in, like, you just pulling off <laughs> snare drum solos or something. It's just so. It would just I be so about that. You know what? It would be a, a breath of fresh air. It's another element yeah. of your, your your personality. Yeah. How many people would appreciate drummers, especially musicians? Oh my gosh, she gets me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I'm going to her because she's a drummer. <laughs> but I mean, that would be amazing. Yeah. So I, is, I need to. I, I mean, honestly, I need to branch out and do something a little different. So. I totally think so. Yeah. That's it's such an interesting aspect of your personality. Yeah. I completely forgot about that. Because we talked, you mm-hmm. brought up, you saw my. I'm like, that's right. Yes, you're a drummer. Yep. I completely forgot about it. We have. It's been a while since we've caught up. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, what were you? So, mostly big band jazz is that? What, is that your spang spangalang type stuff? Oh or? well, really, mm-hmm. I have to say, Rodgers and Hammerstein, Broadway. Bro- okay. All those musicals. That was just like the best. My favorite. Show tunes, things yes. like that. Okay. Absolutely. You weren't really a rocker. You weren't into the Who or anything. No, like no, Ginger Baker. I wasn't. I wasn't a rocker, and my husband was, and mm-hmm. still is. What does he play? You know, he played trombone. That's how we met in the band at Lipscomb. Mm-hmm. But he he doesn't really play instruments. He's a, a retired choir director, mm-hmm. and so he was at the front, you know, waving his hands and all. But that's sort of how we met, and then we both sang the acapella. What? Um, you know, just for one year, I think one of my years that I was there, mm-hmm. and um, but I my my favorite is Broadway musicals. Really? Yes. I could see that. I, I we I really got into Broadway musicals in Vegas. My wife okay is very big into them. Um, we started when we lived in the tri-state area. Well, mm-hmm. I could mean anything around here. You know, New York, but, New Jersey, Connecticut. Yeah, <clears throat> we used to take a train down to New York City and catch an impromptu show because I worked at the radio station at the time that the general sales manager would come in at 4.30 and say, hey, I got an extra pair of tickets to Les Mis. You and Courtney want to go? Oh, awesome. I would call Courtney and be like, hey, I got two extra extra tickets to Les Mis. Yes. Okay. (laughs) Here we go. Oh, my daughter lives in New York, my oldest. Okay. And so she is in the entertainment industry. Mm -hmm. Um, Mostly she's writing and wants to write and she's directing an off-Broadway Show, but anyway, so we get to we go to see her many times, but we just saw MJ up mm-hmm. there, the Michael Jackson musical. Okay, okay, fabulous. Really, I could not take my eyes off of him. So the the actor they have playing Michael is yeah. So it's a, it's a story about Michael Jackson's life and it takes place in a recording studio and it has all the flashbacks that you might expect. But he won the the Tony for best actor. Really. And he was just fabulous. I loved it so much. Is it the next Hamilton, you think? Um, I don't know that it would be that. No. But it was certainly entertaining and thoughtful and just nostalgic because, you know, I I grew up watching Soul Train some. You know, that's about as hard rock as I got. But mm-hmm. still, I loved the Osmond Brothers and Jackson 5 and the Carpenters and all that. 
Did you listen to, um, there's a show out there called Dear Evan Hansen? Does that ring a bell? I, yeah, I know the show. I have not seen that show on Broadway or in mm-hmm. any other live event, uh, but I, I've watched part of the movie, which probably isn't as good as what the show would be. Now, it's my daughters... Okay. on Truncated the, version. My, yeah. on, my daughters loved it. They saw it and they loved it. I've never seen the play. My daughter... Uh, listen to the, I guess, the keynote song, mm-hmm. um, Waving Through a Window, several years ago. And I appreciated the fact that she was getting into this style of music. She found her own taste in music, mm-hmm. very melodic. You can understand the words, you know, yeah. complete polar opposite of what I listened to when I was her age. Mm. But she, we just listened to the song over and over again. Of course, it gets it becomes like an earworm. Yeah. And... <laughs> It grows on you. Same thing with Hamilton. I wasn't really into Hamilton at first until my family just watched it over and over and over again. But this one song, Waving Through a Window, is just like, oh my God, this is a great song. Well, I'll have to look that up. Yeah. I don't know I'm going to play it. When we're done here, I'm going to remind me, I'm going to play you a okay. video of Rich playing that song. Wow. Uh, we did something like a one-off for his podcast. Um, we decided to uh, say, okay, can you, and I said, I'm fascinated by this being the fact that I'm a drummer that doesn't know how to read music mm-hmm. or charts or anything like that. You said you can listen to a song, chart it out, and then go play it like perfectly. He goes, wow. well, that's what I do. I go, all right. So we have a video of him actually listening to the song for the very first time, charting out all the parts. Wow. And then he goes, sits down at the drums and plays it and that- knocks it out of the park. You know, yeah. like parts were completely mirrored perfectly. So I'm a practice, practice, practice girl. <laughs> uh, that's how I am too. You know. I have to listen. Well, I'm, I'm a practice, practice, practice yeah. guy, not a girl. Yes. <laughs> you know. But I mean, I look at. I in order for me to learn a song, I have to listen to it and memorize it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I can play. I can sit down and play stuff that I've played in bands. Like I haven't skipped a beat though. I can go in and do about do the first rehearsal of any mu- Broadway musical, just about not the mo- not the more modern ones, but the old ones, Guys mm-hmm. and Dolls, um, Oklahoma, whatever. And it's the second rehearsal that I flub up on. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Consistently. Wow. So then I have to practice, practice, practice. But how you have a buttery snare drum roll, a nice it's, buttery flow, like it's. <sighs> I can do an open roll or mm-hmm. of closed roll. Depending on the I love scenario. That about you. <laughs> singing wise, karaoke, what do you like singing? Oh. All show tunes? Show tunes, but gotta love Patsy Klein. Oh, yeah. okay, cool. I'm in, I mean, my jam is Neil Diamond. Oh, and that's a good one. Yeah. That's where my voice naturally sits. Yes. You know? I know I could pull that off. I'm not putting myself outside my comfort zone or right. trying to go for notes that I know I can't hit. You know, <laughs> him and Tim McGraw, typically I can pull off, you know, some of the lower crooners, maybe not, but yeah. I, I have to have, be really having a good vocal night to yes. do that. Okay. So, but typically, Neil Diamond, I could pull off. Well, there you go, Dr. Kelly Rice. How do people find and follow you and all that fun stuff? Oh, well, they can um, go to kellyrice.com. That's Kelly E. Rice.com because of how you spell my first name. That's right. Or, or give us a call at 615-373-4488. And I'm going to put all the... Uh, links and everything in the description so make sure you follow along you got all your socials and maybe uh sooner or later we'll see some drumming tiktoks coming from dr kelly rice i think so i think so i think that's a great idea i'd love to see you play if anything you should really integrate it into your next uh bni featured presentation i've already been thinking about (laughs) (laughs) or maybe i've got mine (laughs) i've got mine at the end of october i think so maybe you can just kick some jokes for me Okay. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll do it. There we go. <laughs> well, there you go. What's your problem? Podcast.com. Thank you, Dr. Kelly Rice, for coming in. Check out uh, all her links in the description. Of course, check us out. If you like us, rate us. If you don't like us, uh, let us know why, and maybe we'll figure out how you can give us a good rating. Five stars or less would be appreciated. If you have any questions, please reach out. Everything's at what's your problem podcast.com. Again, thanks for listening. Thanks for hanging out. Dr. Kelly Rice, always appreciating sitting down with you. It's always fun. May as well, Jim. Thanks. 